Halo Dokter Gif Mahlena. Halo Gif. Can you hear my voice? Yes. Uh, good, good morning. How are you? I am fine. And how are you? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, I, I noted the, the time difference. It's, 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 uh, it's 5 a.m. this side. So <laughs> it's, it's early morning. Uh, no, in, in Zimbabwe it's 7 a.m., right? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Here is already 10, 10 a.m. Yeah. Oh, okay. Long time, eh? How have you been? Ah, I am here. <laughs> I am I am in the university. <laughs> but you're ah, very active. I saw that you, your CV is very wow, amazing. Amazing CV. That's why I have to learn from you. <laughs> oh, oh yes, yes. I, I did send the, the, the CV to. Oh, uh, nice. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Great. Right. He's my senior. Keep. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we have some students from the inorganic course. Yeah, we have in organometallic course today and I have in my class is uh, inorganic structure elucidation. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, no, that's fine. And also, some of my students uh, just attended the course of supramolecular chemistry. That's why it's uh, connect to your topic, I think. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, of course, there is uh, some great overlap between uh, supramolecular chemistry, coordinated chemistry, and organometallic chemistry also. Yeah, that's that's what we we look at. So I'm sure you you pick uh, one or two things from my presentation probably today or um, the, the the other day on the sixth of May, right? Right. Yeah. Is Pak Abu here? Hello, Pak Abu. Pak Abu, bisa digabung nggak ya ini? Belum ada. Oh ya sambutan Bu Saiti. Enggak usah. Enggak ya. usah. Langsung aja ya. Iya, langsung aja. Yes. Ini mahasiswa ini baru 28 ya. Wait, Tata. I will call my student to come. Ya. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, how how big is the class? Ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Uh, I think I have around 35 students and Pusayakti has how many students, Bu? Uh, 19. 19. Berapa, Bu? 19. Uh, uh, around 19. Uh -huh. Oh, 19. Oh, okay. That's fine. Big. The class is big, but I think it's manageable. <laughs> <laughs> So how, you, how are you doing the lectures? Are you also doing online lectures um, because of the coronavirus or you? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So uh, due, due to this pandemic, COVID pandemic, this one, uh, we, we arrange our lecture to be online. But for oh. students that's uh, doing the bachelor thesis, the final project for the bachelor project, this one, oh, they okay. should uh, work in the lab, but with strict oh. uh, protocol. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. And how is the situation in Zimbabwe or in Africa? Uh, uh, the in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, right? Yeah, the situation is now. Dakamu yang Razi Sumba, position Deputy Dean Faculty of Science and Technology. You as Deputy Dean, right? No, no, no. Dr. Flynn. Fidelis Sikondo. Siapa itu bu? Who is the ini person? Mas, mbak, Pak Egi jenengnya siapa? Fidelis Sikondo. Kif, no. Kif, Mah, Kif Mehlana. Kif Mehlana. Oh, Kif yeah. Mehlana. Oke. Okay. Kif Mehlana. Oh.
Well. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I, I, I have enough power on my computer. So I will just plug my computer. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Are you ready with your presentation, Keith? And may we start? Or maybe yes. five minutes uh, later? Or we start now? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. If like this, maybe I will open the, the meeting, yeah? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning. Maybe it is still morning enough here in Indonesia. Now we are, we are now in 10 10 a.m. Yeah, in the morning. And good morning, uh, Dr. Sayakti, as a lecturer of organ metallic chemistry at the chemistry department of Spurs Marit University. And good morning, Dr. Kif. Mehlana from Department of Chemical Technology, Faculty of Science and Technology, Midland State University in Zimbabwe. Uh, well, introduce, please, uh, please introduce myself that uh, I am Vitri Wahyu Lestari uh, from the Chemistry Department, especially from Inorganic Division, yeah, uh, the Chemistry Department of uh, 11 Maret University. Uh, today is our special uh, Uh, lecture, yeah. We have guest lecture from Zimbabwe, and I think now I will be your host uh, in this uh, lecture. And before we start the lecture, I will read the short CV from Dr. Kif. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kif has uh, his PhD Hans in chemical technology from the Midland State University. It means that you come back in your university, yeah, in Zimbabwe, Kif. And then in 2014, uh, he uh, he received the PhD degree in chemistry from the University of Cape Town uh, from South Africa, this is the center of Africa. And I think we met uh, in Sweden, yeah, Give. That's why I I know Give from the summer school in Sweden, yeah, about topological, topological chemistry for MOF, yeah. And Dr. Kif continued the postdoc uh, degree or the postgraduate diploma in tertiary education in Midland State University in Zimbabwe. And here you can read that uh, she has received uh, several uh, fellowship or scholarship. Yeah? And here the, uh, very interesting that uh, she received also so many uh, prestigious awards. Yeah? From, I think I will read some, it's uh, very impressive that in 2018, Uh, he received the FOSS Agro UNESCO UPEC Research Grant in Green Chemistry. Oh, the amount is very high. <laughs> Around mm -hmm. um, 23,500 yeah, US dollars. <laughs> wow. Then she was selected also as Periodic Table of Young Chemist Award by UPEC in 2019. And also see, uh, he, he received a European Crystallographic Association Travel Grant. Dr. Giff is uh, an expert in single X-ray crystallography. Yeah? And also in 2019, she was selected, uh, he was selected as future leaders from uh, African Independent Research and Flair Grand Royal Society. This very uh, prestigious grant. Yeah. Oh, the money is probably amazing also. <laughs> and in 2020, Uh, he also received the Flair Collaborative Research Grant from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Yeah? And just recently, he received Network Research Grant Research Council. This means that he's very active uh, scientist. Yeah? And, yeah. And today, he will present the topic about the uh, MOF. Um, I asked him to, to present from the basic concept and then synthesis and then also application in sensing in sensing also in carbon dioxide utilization. Yeah. Maybe he, some of the project was funded by the RSC yeah, or from the FLARE also, from, from the FLARE Grand Royal Society. Okay, Keith, now um, the time is for you. No? I present, I, I offer the time around 90 minutes yeah, for your presentation. Okay. I 
Are you ready with your slide, uh, Give? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the um, kind introduction. Oh, I yeah. will, yes, I will try to remove my video so that at least I will increase the band uh, gap. Um, so, um, like um, the introduction that has been given, um, I'm from Zimbabwe and um, I, I met um, with uh, Dr. Wittry, I think that was in, uh, in, in Sweden uh, during uh, the, 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 um, the, 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 the summer school where we were learning about topology. Uh, since then, we've been communicating uh, through various um, uh, platforms. So I have just shared my, um, my presentation titled uh, Meta-Organic Frameworks uh, from Basic Concept to Application for Sensing and Carbon Dioxide Utilization. So um, he, when I was doing my PhD, um, I focused on uh, sensing uh, using Meta-Organic Framework. Uh, but now as a principal investigator, I am looking at uh, carbon dioxide utilization. So in today's presentation or in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about um, meta-organic frameworks in general and in their application in sensing. I will also touch briefly on carbon dioxide utilization, but of course the lecture on the, fifth, uh, on the 6th of May will be dedicated to carbon dioxide utilization. In this lecture, I'll go into uh, uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, here in Midlands uh, State University in Zimbabwe and uh, some of my collaborators uh, who are in South Africa and in the United Kingdom. So what you can see there is, um, that's a graphical uh, representation of some of the work that we've been doing. It's actually uh, a cover page in uh, one of the journals that is uh, Crystal Ingecom, uh, where we showed that um, metal organic frameworks uh, can change color depending on the um, environment. For example, if you compress them, uh, what we refer to as a piezochromic, uh, then you also get some color changes. If you apply heat, what we call thermochromic, you also get some color changes. Uh, in various solvents, metal organic frameworks can also show some color changes. And of course, uh, they also respond to light uh, uh, showing uh, different colors. Uh, so just to talk about uh, what is uh, Midland State University in Zimbabwe. The Midland State University is um, one of the biggest universities in Zimbabwe. I think in terms of student population, we are sitting at around uh, 23,000 students. Um, we have what we call um, a multi-campus approach. Uh, so it means we have um, campuses in different cities of Zimbabwe. Uh, and of course, the largest campus is in Gweru, uh, where the Department of Chemical Technology is. So just to uh, also let you know that Zimbabwe, if you just look at the map, uh, Zimbabwe um, is, um, has um, the neighbors of South Africa. Uh, you also have Botswana. You also have um, Namibia. If you can see Namibia, yeah, there's a small stretch there. There is also Zambia. And of course, we also have uh, Mozambique as our neighbors. So uh, that is Zimbabwe for you. And Midlands is um, at the center um, of the country. That's why we call it Midlands State University. We are located at the heart of the country. We call it the city of progress. So what did you expect when you come to Zimbabwe or when you visit Peru? So if you visit us, we have um, a park close to our campus, um, which we call Andro Park. If you go to that park, you can see these uh, people, they are walking with the lions. If you are oh. brave enough, you can also swim with the crocodiles. So if you come here, we'll show you all these uh, things. So uh, let's go to the chemistry of metal organic frameworks. What are metal organic frameworks? You see, in, if you go into literature, you will find different definitions of metal organic frameworks. Uh, because people have been using this uh, to define them. But of course, uh, let's talk about how metal organic frameworks are, co are constructed. So what you basically need to make a metal organic framework is an organic linger, like this is um, a, a bi um, carboxylate uh, linger, and then you can take a metal node or a metal salt, if you mix the two uh, under appropriate conditions, you should be able to get a metal organic framework. So you can see that um, 
the metals are linked by the organic linker to form, uh, it could be a 1D, 2D, or a three-dimensional structure. This is an example of MO5, yeah, which was made in Yag's laboratory. Uh, you can also choose um, linker with um, three binding sites. Uh, this is uh, BTC, uh, the tetracarboxylic acids, and then you can um, link it with uh, this copper um, metal node or metal cluster to give um, Husky one, right? So this is very important. But if you go into literature, you will find uh, different definitions of metal organic frameworks. Uh, some they call them uh, coordination polymers. Some they refer them to as um, organic, inorganic um, hybrid materials. But what is a metal organic framework? So there is a committee which was constituted, I think that was around um, 2010, uh, which looked at terminology of metal organic framework. Uh, this committee uh, is the IUPAC committee, uh, which was headed by uh, Professor Lars Armstrong, um, uh, who is based in Sweden at Chalmers University. And of course, they realized that um, uh, authors use different terminologies to define uh, the same thing. And uh, for literature purposes, this is not very good. Uh, so they tried to come up with an acceptable definition uh, of what a metal organic framework is. So the IUPAC accepted definition of a metal organic framework is that material which has potential voids, potential voids, or a material which uh, can have um, the porosity. But of course, it must uh, meet these um, properties of being constructed by an organic linker and a metal salt or metal cluster or a metal knot. So uh, what is interesting, as you can see um, uh, from this diagram is that uh, the linker, uh, which is our benzene dicarboxylic acid, um, is connected to the um, metal cluster. And in this case, um, it could be zinc, it could be any other metal, and then you form this kind of uh, framework, uh, what we call a metal organic framework. Uh, they have very interesting properties. Um, they promise revolutionary properties as we are going to see in the next slide. Uh, for example, we call them molecular skyscrapers. Why molecular skyscrapers? Uh, this is because metal organic frameworks are very flexible. It means you can introduce functionalities uh, in the metal organic framework so that um, you achieve uh, the desirable properties. Uh, recently, there have been some uh, very interesting developments uh, in the field of metal organic framework. I understand uh, those with the field, um, there have been some breakthrough, for example, uh, in Yag's group, uh, which is based in the United States, they managed to uh, make uh, some metal organic frameworks uh, which were able to uh, capture water from the desert air. So this, uh, this, this promises um, um, some great application in future, especially in those areas where uh, there is no water, uh, desert areas or areas which are prone to drought. E another interesting aspect of metal organic framework is their surface area. So for example, if you take one gram of a metal organic framework, if that one gram is equivalent to the size of the football pitch. That one gram is equivalent to the size of the football pitch. So if you think about uh, catalysis, uh, storage properties, I mean, that is um, a property which can be exploited. So if you are doing catalysis with one gram, it means you are doing catalysis on a football pitch. That is amazing. And then we have um, different classes of metal organic frameworks. In the first generation, when you link the metal ions uh, and get your framework, normally when these metal organic frameworks are formed, there are some guest molecules, for example, the G that is shown here. Uh, the G which is, shown, which is shown here represents the guest molecule. So during synthesis of metal organic frameworks, you can use um, uh, your organic linger, your metal salt, and some solvents. And the solvents that are normally used in the synthesis of metal organic framework um, 
DMF, uh, that is dimethylformamide, uh, methanol or ethanol. So during crystal formation, these solvents are trapped in the channels of the metal organic framework. So when you do your structure solution, you, you see that the molecules uh, which was used uh, or the solvent that was used during synthesis. So the first generation upon the removal of these solvent molecules or what we call the gassy molecule, uh, they collapse. Can you, you can see here, there is total collapse of the framework, right? And then in the second generation, uh, which behave more or less as zeolites. If you remove the gas molecule, the framework remains intact. And this is very, very important, especially in solid state chemistry or in material chemistry, because we want to exploit the porosity that is um, left upon um, removal of the gas material. And at the same time, the second generation of metal organic framework they also allow you to reinsert the gas molecule. So it means you can uh, take out and bring in the gas molecule, or you can even bring in a completely different uh, gas uh, molecule. Uh, this property is normally, um, uh, that property is normally uh, exploited in drug delivery. If you see uh, research in drug delivery, they make use of these uh, probably uh, second generation where you can uh, introduce another gas or take out another gas. So for example, you can put your drug here and then when your drug reaches its target uh, site, it is then released, right? Uh, to the uh, target site. So that property is very important. And when you are designing metal organic framework, you need to know uh, its applications and at what applications are you going to use so that at least you choose the appropriate um, organic lingers and metal nodes. We also have um, the third generation. So the third generation, upon the removal of the gas molecule, shows some degree of flexibility. It shows some degree of flexibility. And upon um, reinserting the gas molecule, um, the original uh, framework is kind of uh, retained. The original framework uh, is retained. Also, this is also very important. Um, in different applications uh, where you want your material to be flexible so that you can achieve uh, the desirable properties. Now, let's move on to the fourth generation, which um, I, is the most interesting, uh, especially when you want to interface um, uh, supramolecular chemistry or crystal engineering with organometallic chemistry. Because uh, when supramolecular chemistry meets organic chemistry, you have some very beautiful chemistry. And this is where we, uh, we want to play it and do our catalysis or our sensing. So in my research at the present moment, I am working with the fourth generation of materials. In basically, it means if I take, um, so the fourth generation will allow you to take the gas molecule out. If you take the gas molecule out, you can then uh, introduce some functionalities within the morph. For example, if your morph should have active sites which can bind to uh, a catalyst uh, or uh, a metal that is highly catalytic active, for example, you can have some pyridyl sites um, which you can exploit to make sure that your ruthenium, uh, your palladium, your platinum can coordinate um, after removing the gas molecule. And then of course, you can carry out your catalysis. You can also introduce um, uh, organic compounds uh, in the um, morph. You can also do synthesis uh, inside the morph to introduce uh, whatever compounds that you want so that you can uh, do certain applications. So this is the fourth generation. And of course, in my last uh, presentation, especially when I'm talking about um, catalysis and design of morphs, uh, for carbon dioxide hydrogenation. Uh, this is where we will be talking and I will show you a few examples on how um, we can do synthesis inside the MOF, how we can um, introduce active sites in the MOF and also how we can preserve um, the structure of the MOF. Because one of the most uh, pressing issues about MOFs is that they are not very stable, especially in water. 
And you know, with the green chemistry, we want to carry out our reactions in, in, in water. So how do we uh, introduce stability, especially uh, with regards to MOF when you are carrying catalysis? So all these aspects I'm going to talk about uh, probably today or in the following lecture. Now, so when you uh, look at design in the synthesis of MOFs, uh, there are certain factors that you need to consider. For example, its application for use, uh, thermal and chemical stability, and of course, you need to choose a linger based on the nature of its application. If we have uh, several techniques uh, that can be used to make your MOFs in the lab. I will start with the uh, solvo thermal technique. Uh, in this technique, um, you mix your metal salt and your ligand um, using an appropriate solvent. Let's say you take DMF and then um, you heat um, in an oven, for example, um, for any period of time until you get the crystals. In normally time 48 to 96 hours, uh, yes, uh, it's okay. Uh, temperature can range from as uh, low as 60 degrees uh, up to 120, uh, depending on the solvent that you are using. Uh, especially with the DMF, you can go up to 120, but uh, if you use a very high temperature, you also favor the decomposition of the solvent that you are using. Uh, which might not be good for that kind of reaction. So you also need to know uh, the decomposition temperature of the solvent uh, that you are using. We also have um, a less energy intensive process, which is solvent evaporation, where you mix your metal salt, uh, your ligand and your solvent, and then you just leave it at room temperature to, uh, for the solvent to evaporate. And as the solvent evaporates, uh, crystals are formed. The advantage of this uh, technique is that it does not use energy, um, but of course uh, the disadvantage is that it takes um, so long. Uh, for example, here you have a period of uh, seven days uh, to seven months. Some can even take uh, more than seven months. So that's a disadvantage, and especially uh, for students that are doing their research when they when you don't have another method to produce the crystals. So if you work with this um, slow evaporation, you may also run into those issues of. Um, taking uh, very long to get your crystals. And from my experience, one of the disadvantages of slow evaporation is that you tend to form crystals that, um, that are not, um, that are very, that are, that are soluble in uh, certain solvents. For example, my research uh, focus on heterogeneous catalysis. So you don't want your morph to dissolve during um, catalysis. So normally when you do um, slow evaporation, the MOFs that you get normally, they tend to dissolve uh, during a catalysis. But of course, MOFs that form during solvo thermal, because if a MOF is forming or if a crystal is forming around 20, 120 degrees Celsius, you don't expect it to dissolve during catalysis. So normally um, our synthesis uh, will, uh, normally revolves around solvo thermal uh, techniques uh, for synthesizing MOFs for heterogeneous catalysis. But of course, uh, this technique is also great, but not very useful, uh, especially in catalysis, but maybe for sensing applications. Uh, we also have um, another uh, interesting technique, um, which you can also use uh, to make your MOF, which we call the mechanochemical uh, synthesis. And with the mechanochemical synthesis, uh, in this case, you are not using any solvent uh, to make your MOF. You are just taking your metal salt and your ligand uh, in the appropriate ratio, and then you co-grind. Uh, as you can see here, temperature will range from 30 minutes to two hours, and thereafter you should have your product. So there are quite a number of MOFs which have been made uh, using this technique. This is a very great technique, especially if you want to upscale your MOF, because one of the drawbacks of the, of the solvo thermal technique and the solvo, uh, slow evaporation is that the yield that you get is very low. And uh, for practical application, uh, the mechanochemical method um, is very useful. And also it doesn't use energy. Uh, it's also part of green chemistry because you are not using any uh, solvents uh, to do that kind of work. But of course you get a uh, very high yield. We also have other uh, techniques that are emerging like the electrochemical method, which is also being used uh, to make MOFs. I will not go into the details. We also have uh, the microwave technique uh, that is also being used, and of course, the sonar chemical. These techniques are very, very good, but these techniques are normally used um, for already non-existing uh, morphs, 
right? Because if you use them, you are likely to get uh, powders which are not suitable for single crystal X-ray uh, diffraction uh, studies. But of course, if you have advanced skills in powder X-ray diffraction and solving structures in powder, using powder data, maybe you can do that. But for the purposes of single crystal X-ray diffraction, it means we target solve thermal and solve slow evaporation to get our crystals. But once you work with electrochemical, uh, microwave and sonochemical, as well as mechanochemical, uh, then you should have advanced uh, techniques because you, are, you, you get powders. Uh, you should have advanced techniques of solving uh, structures using powder X-ray diffraction. And I know that's a very, um, that's a very um, interesting area. I, I know some colleagues who are working on that. So these are techniques uh, that are used in um, preparation of metal organic frameworks in general. Um, now, let's look at the chemistry that we can do with the metal organic framework, uh, what we call post-synthetic modification of MOFs. Post-synthetic modification of MOF. Uh, let's say you have your metal salts um, and your organic linger. And then if you mix this in the appropriate ratio, you should be able to form this framework, right? But in this framework, as you can see, you have sites, uh, probably these are pyridyl sites or any sites that allow for uh, coordination or covalent attachment of an um, organic or an inorganic uh, molecule. Right. So the next uh, step is that once you form your framework, you then subject your metal organic framework to um, your compound that you want to introduce into the morph. This could be uh, a metal, it could be an organic compound. And then in the next step, you can see that in your morph, you have um, a, a molecule which is attached to the uh, morph backbone. This chemistry is very important because it will allow us to exploit the metal organic framework in various ways. If this unit here is catalytically active towards certain reactions, this means that we will be able to use this metal organic framework uh, to carry out that particular reaction. The advantage of using metal organic frameworks for reactions is that because of their large surface area, they concentrate certain analyze and um, they are very flexible, like I said earlier on, and uh, normally the yield is very high uh, for these organic reactions that you then care or if the, whether it's catalysis or any other reaction that you can think of. But of course, when you do this, the framework, when you modify your, 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 your metal organic framework with this unit, you can see that the framework is retained. This is not always the case. In some instances, upon modification, there is structural distortion of your metal organic framework. There is structural distortion. So you need to have um, a suitable design to make sure that your morph is not uh, distorted or your morph does not collapse, especially for catalysis, especially for catalysis. That is very important. Now, so let's look at some of the examples of lingers uh, which can be used uh, for post-synthetic modification. So if we look, for example, here, um, this linger here, uh, linger one that I've just, um, that, that I'm showing you, you can see that you have your pyridyl sites, which are the donor atom. These are capable of coordinating to the metal to form a metal organic framework. But because of these OH functionalities that are present, it means upon formation of your metal organic framework, it is very possible to introduce a metal it could be palladium, it could be chromium, it could be any other metal that is able to coordinate to these uh, two functionalities here. In the second uh, case, we have um, a pyridine dicarboxylate um, um, linger. So if your carboxylates are the ones that are going to coordinate to your uh, metal to give the metal organic framework, it means your nitrogen sites are very uh, free in your morph. Therefore, 
you should be able to introduce um, a metal here, which can coordinate through the process of methylation. And of course, you can then exploit your MOV for uh, various applications. The same can also be said for this linger. And the same can also be said here, where you can actually introduce cobalt, nickel at this center after forming the MOV with this linger. So that photosynthetic, like I said, we are talking about the fourth generation of MOV. It's very important. This is why I said in the early slides that meta organic frameworks can be referred to as molecular skyscrapers. They can be tailored for a specific uh, function, uh, which I believe uh, it makes meta organic frameworks uh, very, very interesting uh, for various applications from um, storage, uh, catalysis, sensing, and separation. And uh, the ability to modify or to, 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 to modify meta organic frameworks. Um, it brings us at the interface between supramolecular chemistry and organometallic chemistry. Uh, this uh, example here that I'm showing um, is an example where we uh, have a zirconia morph, uh, and then we introduce this complex uh, through uh, methylation of the purity of sites, as you can see there. Uh, another example, you can also introduce this manganese complex through methylation of the... So you, you now see uh, what I uh, am talking about, uh, the interface between um, uh, supramolecular chemistry and organometallic chemistry, especially with regards to the fourth generation of MOVs allows us to do very beautiful chemistry for various applications. Um, you can also do a covalent attachment. So depending on the linger that you, um, that you choose, for example, this is a dicarboxylic uh, linger with um, an NH2 group. So if you have an NH2 group, you can carry out a condensation reactions within the MOV, right? For example, in the appropriate solvent uh, in THF, you can introduce that as you can see here. Uh, and then uh, again in the, uh, a THF, if you have that, uh, you can also introduce that. So this is very, very in interesting uh, chemistry. Um, so you can see now, if you, you think of your work, how you can use your metal organic framework and how you can use your organometallic chemistry to bring the two together so that you can do various applications. MOV with um, advantages uh, of large surface area, uh, thermal stability, um, their gas uh, adsorption properties, uh, they make them uh, very promising materials, especially for today's applications. So it means you should not be limited to your organometallic chemistry. You can also look at how you can work with the MOVs um, and try to bring in your organometallic chemistry knowledge uh, to do some very, very beautiful chemistry. So now I'll, I, I'll now uh, change the gears a bit. So that was, um, that what I was talking about is uh, MOVs in general and the chemistry of MOVs that, were, that we have seen uh, over the years and how MOVs uh, started um, and where we are today. So today, uh, so now I'm gonna shift the gears a bit and then move to sensing. And here I'll talk about solvatochromic MOVs. What is solvatochromism? So solvatochromism, it is the ability of a metal organic framework uh, to change its color upon ex uh, exposure to various solvent molecules. This arises as a result as the, the change in the energy gap between the ground state and the excited state. So this work that I'm going to show you about so photochromic MOVs, um, it has application in sensing special of solvents. Um, I'll also talk about thermochromic. Um, we also have piezochromic, which is a response to pressure, um, ETC. But today uh, I'll focus more on uh, so photochromic and thermochromic uh, systems. In, in my presentation. So like I said earlier on, this is um, a cover page in, in, in one of the journals that we published. Um, you can go and read uh, on this one. It uh, talks uh, about our sensing, uh, so photochromism. We did a quite um, a review this work. Uh, there's a great uh, information that you can actually learn from that. Um, so let's look at uh, the thermochromic and sovatochromic systems uh, that we uh, prepared um, in um, our work, uh, this work I did it when I was doing my PhD studies at the University of Cape Town under the supervision of Professor Susan Bourne. So during that time, 
I worked with the uh, very simple lingers, as you can see, it has uh, the nitrogen sites and the carboxylate. So I was expecting that um, the nitrogen site can coordinate with the metal. This can also coordinate uh, to give uh, a three-dimensional structure. So in our system, they inherit any aspects of coordination polymer and carboxylate morph, uh, such as that of morph 10. Remember what I said at the beginning. I said the metal organic framework, some of the coordination polymers, some they call them uh, organic, in, uh, organic inorganic hybrid. And um, one of the proponents uh, to make uh, this material was Robson. So what Robson did was to use uh, a bipyridine a linger. Uh, for example, so you have a nitrogen then and a nitrogen there. And what he formed, he referred that to, uh, as a coordination polymer. And then Yagi used um, the carboxylate on uh, both ends and he called them uh, morphs. So this is why I say our system inherits early aspects of early coordination polymers and the carboxylate morphs. So these are the systems that I worked with uh, during my PhD studies. And of course, um, I also I worked with the cobalt, zinc, and nickel. Uh, to form uh, some um, interesting uh, porous materials. So like I said um, earlier on, uh, the technique that I used uh, was uh, solvothermosynthesis in which I dissolved my ligand and then I dissolved my metal salt and then I mixed the two. And of course I put in this uh, autoclave or um, and then I seal. And then after 72 hours, I was able to get uh, this uh, uh, purple crystal. So this reaction was carried out at 120. Uh, in the DMF and uh, ethanol, um, and then you get uh, these purple, uh, very beautiful purple crystals. And um, it was very interesting to note that um, in the single crystal uh, X-ray uh, fraction studies uh, revealed that um, in the cobalt uh, center uh, is coordinated to six donor atoms to give a distorted octahedral geometry. Um, this uh, crystal uh, in the tetragonal crystal system and space group I4, and of course, a very um, large unit cell. Um, so this is the packing diagram of that uh, crystal here. Um, as you can see in this uh, packing diagram, we have um, three distinct channels. Uh, for example, channel A, uh, which is said that here, has only water molecules as the guest, which is occupying. Remember, I said when you synthesize your morph, um, the solvent that is used is, uh, is captured in the pores of your mob. So I have a channel here with water molecules. Okay, probably I'll call it channel A. I also have a channel here with the DMF that is dimethylformamide and the water molecules. And uh, channel three, it has water molecules and ethanol. Very, very interesting chemistry. Um, and of course, at uh, the pre-organization of this gas molecule to say, you know, you must go into that channel, you must go into that channel. A closer look at these channels, you analyze these channels, shows that these channels um, are different. They look similar, but of course, the supramolecular interactions that exist uh, in these channels could be responsible for the uh, selectivity that we are observing here. If, for example, in uh, the channel where you have the DMF molecules, for example, this channel, there are strong pi pi interactions um, between uh, the, the phenol rings. Uh, so that is that is uh, intramolecular interaction between uh, the phenol rings. Uh, and a closer look at um, the uh, guest molecules, especially in that channel, uh, the, 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 they are no uh, interaction but, uh, between the guest and the host in terms of strong interaction. But of course, weak. Um, um, interactions exist, such as the Van der Waals interaction. And um, when we took uh, that crystal there, and when it was mounted in a single crystal diffractometer, remember it's purple in color. E, this is a crystal that is mounted in, um, on a single crystal diffractometer. E, what I observed that I observed a color change. E, there is a yellow material that is forming and it's moving towards the center of the crystal. So it means this material here is changing color and the color change is happening towards the center of the material. So it's changing from purple to yellow towards the center 
of the crystal. This was very uh, interesting observation. And this then prompted us to investigate um, this material further and to try and understand uh, the origins of the color change in this crystal. So what we then um, did um, was to take uh, the crystals, uh, as you can see, uh, the s bed crystals, we exposed them to air, and then uh, this was at room temperature, and you can clearly see uh, Hello, Keith. I think there is a problem with the connection, I think. It is with the... ...restored. Okay? It remains amorphous, even though the, 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 it reverts back uh, to the original color at 220. But of course, in, the structure is not retained. Very, very interesting there. So we published this work in uh, 2012, that was in Georgian Trans. I think this was my first publication. It uh, just came, uh, I think it was during my birthday day when it was online, I was very happy. Um, I published this work when I was in, just doing my, um, my master's, uh, in my first year of my master's. But of course it continued up to a PhD level. And then we then decided to look at uh, this morph or, or, or the powder of this morph uh, in different solvents. Uh, what we realized that um, when we heated it uh, to try to drive off the DMF, um, it's purple, in DMF it's purple, and then in water, like I said earlier on, it's um, yellow, and then in, when you soak it in methanol, it goes to pinky. And uh, our studies use, uh, using the UV, well, the state UVVs uh, is consistent with the observed colors. What is interesting to note is that um, the PX D of the SMED material is very similar to the dried phase or the activated phase where you have removed the gas material or molecules. This means that upon removing your gas, your framework remains intact. The framework remains intact. And upon uh, subjecting the morph to DMF, the framework also did not change its integrity. Uh, to benzene, uh, we also subjected to benzene uh, it did not change, it remained intact. Uh, to methanol, as you can see, upon uh, subjecting to methanol, the PXRD changes. This means that uh, there was a crystalline to crystalline transformation uh, upon insertion of methanol in the uh, pores of our morph. And then in ethanol, uh, you can see that uh, <clears throat> We only have one major peak here, and some peaks are disappearing, which also signifies some uh, transformation. And um, the same also applies with water. When you subject it to water, um, it, it becomes less crystalline. Now, what we then did was to uh, further look at um, how the transformation takes place, and especially in ethanol. Remember what I said. I said when you subject it to uh, ethanol, 
the color changes from purple to, uh, to pink. And the PXRD also shows that there is uh, some transformation that took place when you compare it with the original mob. So we decided to take the original crystal. Uh, we soaked it in um, methanol for 24 hours. Um, we were able to follow this reaction using single crystal X-ray diffraction. Um, after subjecting it to uh, methanol for 24 hours, we, we collected the data using single crystal. Uh, we realized that the DMF gas molecules in the first structure have been replaced by some uh, methanol in the water. And then we said, that's fine. Let's uh, leave it uh, in uh, methanol for some time. Uh, we did that. We left it uh, for about four weeks in methanol. And then we observed the color change. When you observe this color change, he, fortunately, he, the crystals uh, were good enough to do some data collection. We then did that data collection and then we uh, uh, got another structure, uh, which was completely different uh, to the um, first and second structure. And then of course, um, and then we said, can we go back uh, to the first structure? Now, so what we then did is, we left it uh, for more than four weeks again in methanol. And then uh, we did some single crystal data collection. And we also observed that ah, this transformation is still going on because we also got a completely different structure to that one. As you can see in this structure um, from this pecking diagram and that pecking diagram, they're different. And of course, also their, uh, their calculated patterns are also different. We say it's fine. This is a transformation that took um, for, for uh, more than four weeks, and we say, is it possible to move from this structure to back to go back to the original structure? And then we said, no, no, it's fine. Let's soak these crystals in DMF because remember, DMF and ethanol uh, is, is the solvent that we use to make this move. And then let's say, let's soak these crystals in DMF and ethanol and see what happens. Um, and then after. A day I checked, I did not see a color change. I came back uh, the following day. I started to see uh, some color change taking place. Uh, the crystal was changing now from this color to purple or to the original color. And then after 72 hours, I took those crystals. Um, again, we're fortunate enough. Um, and then, uh, of course, the, 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 the crystals were not good enough for single crystal. So we did some powder extra diffraction, which confirmed that the structure really uh, converts to the original structure. After all this series of transformation, this crystal is able to change the color from this to the purple color, which is accompanied by a total um, reversible transformation. This is uh, very interesting. Very, very interesting. I did not show the reason why we um, were able to get the original structure. But I looked at, if you see uh, in, in your Van der Waals uh, is your guest. I looked at the guest topology. I looked at this guest topology. Uh, the guest topology, when you analyze it, it will form um, a diamo, a dia structure or a diamondoid structure, right? Or a diamondoid network. So the guest is a diamondoid network. And this morph here, not the case, this morph is also a dire structure in terms of the topology. So we concluded that this transformation is templated by the guest. So it means this structure here, the transformation will build around the guest. There is a template guest. What, what we then refer to as guest was information transfer. This was made possible by the information which was stored in the topology of the guest, that information was then transferred to the topology of the framework of the original structure. If you did not understand this, maybe you can ask me after uh, finishing my presentation, maybe I'll be able to uh, further explain. Now, so this is uh, what we uh, have been doing with um, in terms of sovato which I said this is due to uh, this is basically color change when you expose your morph 
uh, in different solvents and it is applications in sensing of other small molecules. Now, let's uh, shift the gears and then we move to thermochromism. Thermochromism, this is the ability of your material to change, um, to change color upon um, application of temperature or upon, uh, different, uh, be, upon being subjected to different temperatures. And in this case, uh, let's look at the thermochromism in a 3D hydrogen bonded network. Um, I made this, um, I made this, um, this uh, network. Um, so what you see here, you have your water molecules. The network builds around the water molecules, which is able to form uh, hydrogen bonds, uh, as, as you can see uh, in the uh, diagram below, uh, with the other um, uh, 1D ch channel. So your carboxylate in this case are free, which also participate in your hydrogen bonding. So I, 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 this is not a morph, but it's, I just want to illustrate certain concept when it comes to thermochromism. This is a discrete complex, which is um, built by um, hydrogen bonding interactions. So if you can see this hydrogen bonding interactions, the, dot, the, rot, the red dots that I show uh, shows that they exist some hydrogen bonding interaction. But of course, I want to illustrate this um, in thermochromism. I thought this is a perfect example, especially for this lecture, to see the origins of thermochromism. Some uh, thermochromism normally originate from um, change in the geometry as you hit uh, your compound, change in the geometry around the cobalt center. You know, cobalt is very rich when it comes to colors. But in this case, we want to demonstrate uh, where is color coming from, especially uh, when you use a cobalt uh, 3D hydrogen bonded complex or a network. So this week, uh, if you want to uh, read more about this week, it has been published in Polyhedron uh, in 2015. So there's um, a, a, a lot of uh, very interesting stuff in that uh, paper. So the thermochromism, um, like I say, it's the ability to change color upon exposure. So when we made uh, the crystals of this compound that you see here, um, uh, under the hot stage microscope, we managed to follow uh, the changes uh, in temperature. So at 30 degrees, uh, you can see even at 50, there's a slight color change. At 90, uh, the color change. At 100, you can now start to see some bubbles which signifies uh, the loss of the coordinated water molecules. And of course, at 150, there's a complete color change, right? So what we then did uh, is that we tried to follow um, the changes in the PXLD pattern uh, of this material as we hit it, as you can see here. Uh, we picked the 002 reflection. So this is your 002 reflection. As you can see, as we increase temperature up to 180, you can clearly see that there is a shift um, to the right, uh, sorry, to the left. There's a shift to your left of the uh, 002 reflection. This means something is happening on the unit cell, right? Something is happening on the unit cell. It means the unit cell parameters are changing. Could that be responsible for the color changes that we see, especially at this lower temperature at 50 and 90? We also realized that at a very high temperature, uh, above 90, as you can see here, we try to pick uh, that, uh, these uh, pixels are dipping. You can see at 30, 60, 90, uh, they look more or less the same. But of course, at 120, you can see that there's a complete shift to uh, your right of that peak there, and some peaks disappear, right? This is um, a structural change that is taking place before uh, collapse of your 3D hydrogen. Uh, bonded complex because remember we have water in that which is responsible for hydrogen bonding so as you are heating uh, up to 150 it means you're also driving off the water molecules and as you drive the water molecules you should expect your uh your 3d hydrogen bonded complex to collapse so at 180 there uh you can clearly see that there is a collapse of the framework there are no more peaks very very interesting now so what we then realized was that uh, we, we followed um, the temperature changes uh, and the unit cell parameters, uh, and then try to find out what is happening to the unit cell. Uh, so this is um, along the B axis. As temperature is uh, increasing uh, along the B axis, as temperature is increasing, the B axis is uh, contracting, right? You can see that uh, the B axis is contracting. Um, the A axis is also contracting. And of course, the C is expanding and the 
So the C is expanding, but the net result of this is a reduction in the unit cell volume. Okay? Is a reduction in the unit cell volume. Now, I'll go back to uh, where I started. So you, you can clearly see that uh, at these temperatures, uh, especially um, 30, 50, 90, it was too crystalline. So we, we were able to deduce uh, the unit cell parameters using uh, powder X-ray diffraction. So we, we did uh, this in Pauli, we did some ridge field refinement to get those uh, unit cell parameters. This was not single crystal data, but it was used uh, to find the unit cell parameters. But of course, at 150, you should not, you, we did not get any unit cell parameters because that's when your, 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 your 3D hydrogen complex uh, collapses. So this color change that you observe is a result of compression. Uh, from 30 to 90 degrees, the color change observed is a result of compression. But of course, this deep, uh, deep um, purple color that, uh, that you see, or it looks like blue, is as a result of uh, the change in the geometry around the cobalt center. Remember, the, the water was driven out during that process of heating. But at this particular point here, before the water comes off, remember your water is coming at around 100 degrees. That's, you, that's when you can start to see the bubbles. But from 30 to 90 degrees, the color or the thermochromism in the 3D hydrogen bonded complex is as a result of the compression in the unit cell volume. But of course, uh, above that, uh, 100 to 150, that is due to change in the geometry uh, around the metal center as water is driven out. Okay, uh, so that is thermochromism, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, using the same system, uh, we also looked at mechanochromic behavior of the same 3D hydrogen bonded complex. So as you can see here, uh, these are the crystals. When you grind them, they change to from pink to purple. We refer this as a uh, mechanochromic effect. Mechanochromic effect. Uh, the PXRD of the as made material, the purple, you can see that as you grind it, the PXRD of the purple material, which you form here, uh, becomes less crystalline, becomes less crystalline, right? And then, of course, if you then take this purple material and then you subject it to water, you can see that the original peaks, although they have a um, low intensity, are kind of uh, regenerated. So that's a complete uh, reversible rehydration process. That's a complete uh, reversible re rehydration purpose. Uh, for um, this one here is the deep blue that I have shown you uh, upon uh, during thermochromism. Remember, if you look at this um, purple material um, upon um, complete removal of water, uh, it goes into that state. So it, that, that is complete uh, collapse. But of course, here yeah, I was just referring to the thermochromism where you can grind your material, you get your purple material, um, which shows that um, it becomes less uh, crystalline. But of course, you can regenerate this material by soaking in water. As you can see, some peaks um, are matching here, and although they are less intense, but we are more interested in the peak position. Uh, and then, of course, um, the FTR studies. Uh, also confirmed that um, the, the thermochromism that we observed um, is as a result of um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, as a result of uh, change in the geometry around uh, the cobalt center. Right now, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think um, this wraps it uh, on um, sensing thermochromism and sulfatochromism. And of course now, eh, of course I'll take questions at the end, but now allow me to move on to uh, the current work that I'm doing, which is uh, carbon dioxide capture and hydrogenation. E, th this project um, basically looks at um, how we can utilize carbon dioxide. E, remember carbon dioxide is the chief contributor of climate change and global warming. Uh, so we need to find uh, new technologies that we can use to utilize this carbon dioxide. I know in other countries they use, um, they, they do carbon dioxide storage in geo storage, underground storage, but is that sustainable? Can we really um, say uh, carbon dioxide, we can store it? Is that sustainable? 
I think we need to, 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 to look at other methods like uh, carbon dioxide utilization, uh, where we can use carbon dioxide as a um, carbon source for building organic uh, compounds that are very useful in our everyday lives. So this is where we are coming from. And because of that, we want to take advantage of the metal organic frameworks to um, capture carbon dioxide and at the same time, uh, convert the carbon dioxide within the porous morph to formic acids, uh, methanol, ethanol, or any other compound that uh, we feel is necessary for our everyday life. So in my project at the present moment that I'm currently doing, I'm looking at how I can capture carbon dioxide and convert it to formic acid and methanol. This is the work that I'm doing with my master's students and my uh, PhD students. And in the lecture, uh, the second lecture on the 6th of May, I'll be showing you some of the results that we've achieved um, that in that work and some of the work that we've been doing with our collaborators. But in the question is, why carbon dioxide? Why is there so much interest in carbon dioxide capture and conversion? Like I said, remember, we have the natural processes which regulates uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Remember the process of photosynthesis which uses carbon dioxide to make food, right? And of course, there is also respiration, which then uh, breaks down uh, that food um, into carbon dioxide. So that process which regulates carbon dioxide is, is, is no longer able to reg regulate carbon dioxide because we have seen in the past uh, that there has been an unprecedented increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now you can look at, as of 2020, we are sitting at close to about 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's a, that's a, 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 a huge number. And that's, that's, that, that's have some of the consequences that we are facing, like um, floods, uh, fires in Australia, high temperatures, uh, ice melting, ETC. So there is need for us to, to, to find uh, technologies that can uh, harness carbon dioxide that is uh, emitted from uh, industrial activities. If we really need to achieve the uh, net zero emission goal, then we need to find the technologies that can uh, uh, harness carbon dioxide. Not only that, remember there are some missions like, um, I know the Americans, they are sending some um, rovers to Mars. You know, Mars is made up of 98% of carbon uh, dioxide. So it means uh, the air, uh, that side in, in Mars is unbreathable. So how can we make A from carbon dioxide or O2 from carbon dioxide, right? How can we also make energy to use from carbon dioxide if we believe that at one point or the other, humanity will exist on Mars? If we have to migrate to Mars, how can we survive? So the research on CO2 is very, very important from that perspective. Generation of energy, generation of oxygen, mitigating climate change, mitigating global warming. That is very important. But so let's look at uh, some of the sources of carbon dioxide emissions. I think most of the um, I think uh, most of uh, the carbon dioxide emissions uh, comes from the burning of fossil fuels. This is because we need to generate energy. At the present moment, we are using we are all using fossil fuels to generate energy, and I think that is the most contributor. So what can we do? Can we have technologies which can capture carbon dioxide from those sources? and then convert it to energy material like methanol. If we talk of methanol, methanol is a very attractive fuel because it can easily be integrated uh, with the current fuel distribution in uh, infrastructure, especially when you look at um, emerging economies or developing countries such as uh, here in Africa, Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, Middle East, ETC. So methanol is very, very important. Um, furthermore, methanol is a clean fuel when it depends, it doesn't produce a lot of um, carbon emission. So that is uh, very, very important from um, a perspective of green chemistry and methanol is very, very attractive. We can also produce um, formic acid or formic from carbon dioxide, which is um, an energy storage, it stores hydrogen. So, I mean, that's, that's very interesting uh, because hydrogen can be used to power vehicles uh, if we need to uh, achieve uh, zero net emissions. We should start to think of using hydrogen as a fuel. But of course, in, at the present moment, we are not yet there, but I think we are using what we call the, the blue economy, 
the things like formic acid, which can store hydrogen or converting carbon dioxide to methanol or formic acid, um, is something like that. But of course, um, there are also other industries like the cement manufacture, they also produce a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, the natural processes, they also produce uh, carbon uh, dioxide. So all these processes, we need to reduce um, these emissions by coming up with the technologies that are very, very important. So if we see this graph, you can see that uh, China is the leading producer of carbon dioxide. Uh, on a yearly basis, we are pumping about 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the air, uh, primarily from the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, this is uh, a very huge number, and definitely we can do something uh, to reduce that, uh, the, uh, the waste carbon dioxide uh, that is emitted uh, by these industries. Now, let's uh, look at what MOFs can do uh, for uh, carbon dioxide utilization. And like I said, um, we will look at our heterogeneous catalysis. Uh, our MOFs, uh, the advantage is that the MOFs that we have uh, can have what we call open metal sites, which enhances carbon dioxide uptake. When I say open metal sites, uh, maybe I had missed this, during synthesis of our metal organic filaments, it is possible to have DMF or, or water molecules coordinating to the metal sites. So upon activation, you can remove the coordinated uh, solvent molecules. Once you remove the, co uh, the coordinated uh, solvent molecules, you end up having what we call open metal sites. These open metal sites have been shown to enhance the uptake of gases such as hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So we can take advantage of that property in MOFs. Uh, point number two, post-synthetic modification to introduce catalytically active sites. As, a, as you have shown uh, during the first segment, I've said that metal organic fragments can be modified depending on the functionalities or the linger that you choose. So when you modify a metal organic framework, it means you can introduce an active catalyst inside your morph so that you can do carbon dioxide capture in a morph and conversion. That is a tandem system. You capture and then you convert. Very, very interesting. Now, let's look at the design strategies. How can we design morphs or metal organic frameworks which can be capable of converting carbon dioxide to fuels or to useful chemicals, let's say in that way. So in our research, um, we have shown that, uh, I think for the past, I think since 20, uh, 2016, when I, we started this research, uh, we have designed, uh, we have designed um, these lingers, uh, for example, this linger here, uh, so what you have there is um, a morph linger, right? We've designed this linger and then we've made the morph using that linger, right? So what you have, so I'm just showing you a site here where you can introduce or where you can do synthesis of a pizza complex inside the morph. Like I said, a supramolecular chemistry or crystal engineering meeting organic metallic chemistry. What do we create, right? So it means, we can do synthesis inside the MOF. You pre-design that, right? And then you do your synthesis. And then of course, you then get your ruthenium being introduced, which is your active site, which is your, you know, ruthenium is very uh, catalytically active towards hydrogenation reactions. And of course, you can take advantage of that. And of course, um, the next step would be to introduce your, um, your, your carbon dioxide and hydrogen and do the reaction. Today, I'm not going to talk about any results. In the next lecture, I'll go into the details of these uh, studies. But today, I'm just showing you uh, the design strategies that we've been working with, uh, all that stuff. So this is one example that you can do. So you can design a, a wide range of pinza complexes, right? You can synthesize pinza complexes inside your mouth. That is very possible. And this is one example that I've shown you. This was done by uh, one of my PhD students uh, who has since graduated. And uh, it's unfortunate today I did not show the picture, but in the next um, lecture, I'll show you the picture of the student. Um, in another approach, you see, this system will also allow you to design the pizza, to, to synthesize the pizza complex inside the mock, 
But if you look at a closer look, there are different systems. And in my ne next lecture, I will tell you why, why we moved from this uh, system into that system. So in this system, you can synthesize a, uh, a ligand, right? Uh, for example, if you see this ligand here, and then further synthesis will allow you to have this pinza ligand. You all see the pinza ligand already have the catalytically active site, which is your PD. The next thing that you then do, you take this pinza ligand, because it is the OH functionalities, you should be able to synthesize a MOF, a meta organic framework. And already in that, you it means once you form a framework, you already have your active site, which should be capable of doing the carbon dioxide hydrogenation. Right? Uh, we in the previous work we have succeeded doing this, and we are currently preparing a manuscript based on this work. But of course, in the next lecture, details will be unveiled. Today, I'm just showing you the design strategies. You can design any ligand that you want, and then uh, uh, then synthesize your pinza ligand, and then of course, then move to the next step to make your metal organic framework. Okay. In another approach, you can choose uh, this kind of linger here. Uh, this is already let's say this is a morph backbone, and of course, but as you can see here, the nitrogen sites are on different sides. So what you need to do, if you want to introduce a metal, you should be able to activate the CH bond here, what we call cyclometallation. And of course, you should be able to introduce your ruthenium p in your morph. And of course, that will be your active site. This is one strategy. We've published it this way. And of course, in the next lecture, I will discuss about the results and all the nitty gritties of this work. Like I said, today I'm just showing you the designs. Uh, we also have what we call, um, we can also introduce um, what we call frustrated Lewis pairs. Frustrated Lewis pairs, these are compounds which contain uh, an acidic site, like the boron site, and a basic site. And because they are bulky, these sites cannot combine to form an adduct. These uh, frustrated Lewis pairs can int be introduced in metal organic frames. E computational studies, right, have shown that if the frustrated Lewis pairs are able to activate hydrogen and to bind carbon dioxide. So this is a developing area. We are currently working on this area. Uh, we haven't got uh, some promising results, but we are currently working on it. But the computational results again actually shown that this is possible. This is um, metal free catalysis where you introduce these organic compounds in your metal organic framework, and then you do you try to do catalysis with this. But of course, when you introduce them, you need to uh, also think about uh, some practical uh, considerations in terms of um, your carbon dioxide binding strongly to the frustrated Lewis pair. It means it will poison your catalyst. Uh, and of course, your hydrogen, is it going to be introduced first or it will be the last? And of course, um, the chemistry between your morph backbone and the frustrated Lewis pair uh, must not uh, interfere. So these are some of the practical considerations that you should look at when you are introducing uh, frustrated Lewis pairs in your morph. E this uh, brings um, to the end of my presentation. E I would like to acknowledge the Royal Society uh, for giving us the flag grant. Uh, remember, we got about 365,000 um, pounds to do this research on CO2 hydrogenation. Uh, the African Academy of Sciences, uh, they also partnered with the Royal Society. I also want to thank uh, the UNESCO IUPAC um, FOS Agro for the Green Chemistry Grant. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my collaborators, uh, my students, and my PhD supervisor uh, for the work uh, that we did during my PhD studies. In, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to present this work to you. I hope you have learned one or two things. If not, uh, probably in the next lecture, you will learn where I will talk more about CO2 hydrogenation, the mechanisms, and um, the results that we, we got. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will leave this time to you. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, then I'll be free to take the questions. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gif Mehlana. Very, very interesting uh, lectures. Yeah. Oh, a lot of words and a lot of publication. Right. Uh, thank and you for much. the audience, yeah. Uh, please um, ask question. Yeah, if you have question or uh, you have something to discuss here, I uh, offer you to hand your raise hand. Yeah? Please raise your hand and then, uh, or you can um, write your question in the chat box. Yeah? Uh, Doctor Give, maybe I will start. Uh, you study about the um, uh, sensing, yeah, sensing for the solvent in the move. Uh, after the remove, you put some solvent and you treat the, with the heating also and you treat with mechanic also, yeah? And the move so very interesting properties, yeah. Uh, did you always study about the spectroscopy of this uh, phenomena? I mean, uh, maybe you use UV spectroscopy, something like that, to observe the change? Uh, thank you very much. So we did uh, UV visit studies on the solvatochromic uh, effects, uh, but of course on the uh, thermochromic effects, uh, we did not um, uh, look at the um, at the UV vis. But it would be something that is very interesting to also look at that, uh, also using spectroscopic method to really ascertain uh, these color changes, uh, which I said. But of course on the um, solvents effect, we, we use the spectroscopy and the colors uh, were consistent with the wavelengths um, that these um, materials were showing. Mm -hmm. And um, in your paper, I, I still don't read your paper. Uh, did you also describe about the mechanism? I mean, mechanism between the solvent and the frameworks, uh, how they interact each other, so they can uh, give different color in, in, in your case here. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, it's something that I left. It's um, so we looked at, uh, closely at uh, the um, FTIR studies, whether um, there were any changes in the coordination geometry around the metal center. And uh, the FTIR results reveals that there is no coordination change, especially for the sulfatochromic effects. So we then uh, further analyzed the interactions between the host framework and the solvent, and we realized that there were some hydrogen bonding interactions uh, which were uh, responsible for the color changes. And uh, in, in, in case there was also some CH pi interactions uh, which were also involved. So we attribute uh, the color changes uh, to the interactions between the host and the gas solvent molecules as opposed to the um, change in the coordination uh, environment around the metal center. Mm -hmm. And I, as I remember, you present uh, XRD that uh, if the MOF interact with the water and then the, the structure is um, disturbed, I think, yeah, totally collapsed, I think. And that's where yes. some peak are missing, or all, all peak are missing, and then, but the MOF can be regenerated after um, uh, changing the solvent, I think, after we change the solvent. Mm -hmm. What's happening actually is like that. Yes, it's, it's, it's a very interesting. I think um, one of the greatest challenges that we face in the field of MOFs is uh, water. Yeah, water tends to poison the, 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 the morph even um, during catalysis. So you need to be very careful or you need to make sure that the morph that you design, they, 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 they are water stable. That is very important, especially for catalysis application. But in our case, uh, especially for solvent sol sol sensing, we realized that um, the water, was, uh, after upon exposure to water, there is complete collapse of the framework. And, but you can regenerate the framework upon um, soaking uh, your material in DMF. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. It means um, there is a memory effect to say that um, if, uh, if the, the collapse framework can recognize DMF and it will build around the DMF again, but of course in the presence of water, it, it just collapses. It, it, the structure just distorts. And of course, uh, you also observe a color change. And probably the color change that you observe uh, is, is due to coordination change because I mean, there is collapse uh, of, of, of your framework. Um, probably what is going to coordinate was uh, uh, the cobalt sender loves water. So it means that your, your water will also go straight uh, to, your, to, to your cobalt sender. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Nice explanation. And here is a, a question from my colleague here, from Dr. Sayakti. 
uh, he said here, uh, she said here, you can see also in the, you can see in the chat box also. Synthesis of MOV is a story like uh, easy. It's, it's look like easy, <laughs> but what, what uh, effect, what affect the formation of a three-dimensional structure and stability? How how to control the the unwanted product? Uh, thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, you know, it's um, in in in, uh, in morph chemistry. Uh, at times, it's very difficult to predict the outcome of the product. For example, if you take your cobalt and your um, benzene dicarboxylic acid. As, um, as a linger, it's possible that you can form so many morphs with the different topologies, right? Yeah. You can form so many morphs, the reaction conditions, temperature, the solvent, the time of the reaction, it is very much possible that using those two, your cobalt and your linger, which is your benzene dicarboxylic acid or any other linger, you can form a wide range of metal organs. So it's very difficult to control the outcome of the product. But what I can ascertain or uh, assure you is that we have what we call reticular chemistry, which is basically making morphs by design. You should be able to predict if you say, if you take um, a three connected linger, for example, your benzene tetracarboxylic acid, uh, and then you mix it with a metal, which, which is a tetragonal geometry, right? You should be able to predict the outcome, like the, the topological outcome of your morphs, but you cannot predict uh, the space group which is going to crystallize in uh, as well as the crystal system, but you can predict the topology outcome. I think that's, that's my answer. I think that has been the most uh, dilemma in this field. In, we are moving um, in the right direction because now I think we have created a periodic table of um, uh, topology where we can say if you mix uh, this linger or a four connected linger with this tetrahedral uh, geometry, you should be able to get this topology. Uh, so we call that a reticular chemistry, uh, but it's very, very difficult at times to predict the outcome. If you don't do most of the people who enter into this field, especially at the first level, uh, they just mix A and B and then get the outcome. At times they don't have the knowledge of reticular chemistry that will allow them to design uh, morphs uh, for specific uses. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And maybe one question again here: uh, How to control the unwanted byproduct? Maybe uh, maybe it's correlated with uh, purification. Uh, sorry, can you come again? How to control the unwanted unwanted byproduct? Byproduct, something like uh, the purification issue. So, is this during um, is this during more formation or during hydrogenation? During the formation. Oh, okay. So, so, so basically, um, normally when we do these reactions, in, when we do these reactions in, um, when we synthesize the morphs, you, like I said, if you take component A and component B, you expect to get a framework. And in most cases, <laughs> you can get. Um, if you are lucky enough, you can get two crystal forms. And the, by their shape, you can see that uh, these crystals have different morphologies. And then when you do data collection, you can see this is a different structure. And then you do another one, you see uh, there are different structures. You can only control the unwanted products by varying the reaction conditions. For example, if you see, let's say you carry out a reaction mm. at 90 degrees, and then you realize that there is an unwanted product. Try to increase the temperature. Try to increase the temperature to 120 and see if you still get the unwanted product. Maybe at 120, you only get one form of the morph, then the unwanted product has disappeared. So that is very much probable. The only way you can control the unwanted product in morph chemistry is by varying the reaction condition. I had a similar case uh, when I was doing my PhD in the sense that um, I was forming concomitant crystals within the same reaction vial. And of course, I, I was able to uh, isolate both crystals and run the um, single crystal x diffractometer. And then I started to vary the reaction conditions. And I realized that at a particular temperature, one form disappears, right? So it means by just varying the reaction temperature or by just varying the reaction conditions, 
you should be able to isolate one product that you don't know, that, that you want. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Saikti, are there any feedback uh, about your question? Okay, okay, next explanation. Uh, yeah, it's mean that the composition or the, the composition the, is very important. The, yeah. Yes, composition uh, and also condition, yeah. Okay, the temperature. And the target structure. Yes. For the target structure, yes. Oh, I saw Ozzy here. Ozzy, maybe you want to ask uh, some question, Ozzy? Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a question there. Thanks for your presentation. I have a question based on your experience. What factors need to be considered in determining the solvent when the post synthetic modification? And uh, do you think post synthetic modification could affect the yield, um, the yield higher or lower? Okay, so thank you very much. So if you are doing post synthetic modification, so this is I say where I said you are now at the interface of uh, crystal engineering and organometallic chemistry. Uh, one thing that you need is to understand the chemistry of your morph. Uh, is your morph stable in the solvent that you want to use for post synthetic modification? This is what you want to, this is, you need to understand this. Because if your morph is not stable in that solvent, it means you are going to destroy the morph during that process of so, um, post synthetic modification. Normally, morphs are very stable in solvents like ethanol, methanol, uh, and DMF. So you would want even THF they are also stable. So you'd want to carry out your reaction or your post-synthetic modification in solvents that are, um, in, in which your morph is stable, right? So basically before you do your post-synthetic modification, you can do some, stemo, some chemical stability studies where you can um, subject your morph to different solvents. And then of course, you can see uh, in which of these solvents is your morph stable. Once you establish that, it means you should be able to, um, you should be able to um, say, I think I will settle for solvent A because this is where um, my morph is stable. And then you, you, you talk of stability, you talk of the yield. E, normal, so if you are doing post synthetic modification, let's say you are introducing a metal, let's say you are introducing um, ruthenium um, to the pure dioxide. E, the yield, e, I would say the yield that you are referring to probably refers to the amount of ruthenium that has been introduced. I'll take it that way. Um, so the amount of ruthenium that has been introduced uh, will depend on the time of exposure. Remember, you have so many pure dioxides in your morph. So the longer you, you expose your morph to the uh, ruthenium complex, uh, you are likely to get more ruthenium being loaded into the morph. So you can have varying degrees of ruthenium or varying content of ruthenium in your morph, uh, depending on the time of exposure. Let's say if you expose for uh, two hours, you can have 0.5% um, uh, or 0.5% or 0.05% or or uh, of ruthenium in your morph. Maybe after four hours, you, you may have, you may have 0.1% uh, of your ruthenium. So that depends uh, entirely on the period of exposure because your, your ruthenium is attaching to the period of size. And as time progresses, it means you should have more ruthenium um, in your in your morph. Uh, let me just uh, look at other questions. Uh, I'm not so sure if uh, the, the, uh, the, this one has been answered well. Okay, the, I, I think uh, this one says the sophomorph is a story like is saying is but what um, affects the formation of a three-dimensional structure? Uh, stability, how to control unwanted uh, byproduct structures. Uh, linkers are often used, but it is um, but is it never wrong with uh, coupling? Okay, fine. So what I want to talk about is uh, I think I've talked about this question. Um, st stability. What affects the stability in mobs? This is very important from uh, a design perspective. In mob synthesis, it looks very easy when it's presented, but believe me, when you go into the lab you realize it's not as easy as, as presented. There are so many challenges that, that you face. Yes, that yes, that's true. <laughs> Maybe my student also understand about that, yeah? My student, <laughs> <Tendi. Yes. laughs> 
Yes, <laughs> I, I can guarantee you that is <laughs> yes. as, as, as presented. It's very, it's very, very challenging. If you are not careful, you will run away, but we don't want that to happen. But let me talk about stability. How do you control stability in mobs? In, you need to choose the right metal, right? Mm. The right metal. If, for example, right you would metal. see tomorrow, when, uh, not tomorrow, on the, on the 6th of May when I do the presentation, I would choose landonites as my metals because landonites get a high coordination number. I mean, you can go up to eight, right? Mm. It means even if water comes to attack the condition environment, the structure will not be distorted. But if you choose metals which can accommodate up to six, um, I mean, donor atoms, then you will have issues because this is, that water comes and attack that condition environment, uh, they, there will be cleavage of the um, carboxylate uh, oxygen to uh, metal bond uh, of the carboxylate moiety. And that has an effect on the stability. But with, with the Londonites, it can accommodate a high geometry and that gives it the stability. There is also an issue of um, what we call interpenetration. Interpenetration is when you have one network uh, going into the other network, the kind of cutting edge, uh, that also impacts stability in morphs. If you have like a diamondoid structures, so if you, if, you, if you want to form like a diamond structure, these are very stable, right? They are very yes. So we also need to think about that. The other thing that I've mentioned, remember I said the technique for synthesis, so for thermal methods tend to produce highly stable morphs as opposed to solvent, a uh, slow evaporation, where you have just the solvent evaporation, then you get uh, crystals coming out. Some of these things, when you get into the lab, you start to understand how they work. But from a design perspective, if I want a stable morph, I would rather choose a landonite a landonite a metal is opposed to a transition metal. That is one. And or I would also try to choose um, a rigid linger. At times you can choose uh, some flexible lingers, organic lingers. Once you choose them, at times they, they tend to, they, they are not very, um, they, they don't give stability in your mouth. You'd want to have um, a linger that is also very rigid. That also gives you uh, some stability. Uh, I think I think that's, um, that's what I can say. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, stability. I will, I will also look for other questions that I think I missed. Okay, I think um, I've read most of the questions. Uh, if there are any further questions, I'll be able to, to, to take them. And for the move that you have measured, uh, that so the sensing properties for sulfatochromic or mechanochromic or thermochromic, this one, uh, are, are all um, characterized by a single X-ray key after the change, after you expose yes. in several solvent and you treat with uh, several treatment, right? right? Have yes. you measured also so, by single X-ray? Yes, so, 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 so it's, a, it's a couple of, um, of techniques. So I use the single crystal and uh, technique, single crystal X-ray diffraction technique and the powder X-ray diffraction technique. So with the powder diffraction technique, you may be able to, to follow the intercell parameters if you, if, you, if you can do what we call rich field refinement. But with the single crystal, you get all the information that you need, uh, the space group, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of information you get. But powder X-ray diffraction, I also used it, especially to map the change in the intercell parameters uh, mm -hmm. during thermochromism. But for, uh, but for sulfatochromism, I used a uh, single crystal X-ray diffraction uh, to follow those changes. Do you have this uh, instrument in your uh, faculty? Um, in my department, I don't have this instrument. Um, I, I, I rely with my, uh, on my collaborators. I have quite a number of collaborators here in Southern Africa. People in South Africa. In Kipton, yeah? uh, yes, especially in South Africa, where I did my PhD. Here in Zimbabwe, I have the powder X-ray diffractometer. Mm -hmm. But for single crystal uh, purposes, I send my crystals to UCT. Uh, you know, UCT, uh, University of Cape Town is not very far from Zimbabwe. I can also travel to do those experiments because of our good relationship uh, with the group that is there. Mm, okay, okay, okay. Yes, nice. Any other question from the audience? Jessica, maybe Jessica, before Mr. Give left. <laughs> if, if no, and they are not the case, maybe...
we can continue our lecture next week, yeah, Mr. Gif, Dr. Gif, yes, we yes, can yes, continue yes. our lecture next week about the carbon dioxide utilization. This seems very interesting, yeah. Yes, okay. yes. And then we are waiting for your next lecture. Yeah. Mm. Yes. It was a pleasure having you here. Okay. It's very nice yeah, to have your lecture today. And we, I hope that all students can understand about your um, topic. And this topic is also very hot now. In many paper are discussed. Yeah? And then if you have um, like a MOF topic and then we combine with another application like for membrane and then for catalytic and for what is capture or storage, that's a very nice issue. Yeah? Yeah, hopefully in the future we can we make like collaboration with uh, Zimbabwe, with your university. Yeah. And now, okay, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for your presentation and we give applause to Mr. Kivya. Yeah, yeah that, that's good. Thank you, Dr. Kivya. I think I will give your certificate you. next week, yeah, because you still have one lecture. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Mr. Gif, uh, many thanks, yeah, and and we see you again uh, next week, yeah, in the same uh, time, yeah, Thursday on 10 a.m. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for hosting me. It was uh, a pleasure uh, seeing you all. See you. Thank see, you. See you. Okay. Thank you. We bye can bye. take picture maybe before uh, Keith left. Oh, yeah. okay. Maybe, maybe everyone Please can open... put their faces now so that at least you can see everybody. Please, Please open your camera, student. Open your camera, <laughs> Where is the student? Student are black all here. I, 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 see, I see it's dandy, dandy, right? Dendy, yeah, Dendy is my student. <laughs> Dendy yes. is now working with more for sensor, for carbon dioxide sensor. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. At least, yeah. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Maybe so, so I will see you guys to next week. <laughs> yeah. Next, next week when we talk about carbon dioxide utilization in some reactions, uh, some organometallic reactions, uh, you should be able to enjoy that one. Okay, yes, 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 yeah. nice, nice. It's very promising issue, a promising topic. Okay, we take a picture here. One, two, three. Please open the camera, the slide one. And now the slide two, yeah. One, two, three, only two. I think some students are uh, left because they have another course. I think. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Good, uh, many thanks again, yeah, for the audience. And please join us next week on Thursday, 10 p.m. Eh, 10 a.m. Not 10 p.m. 10 a.m. Yeah, in the morning. Okay. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Yeah. Belum belum afternoon lagi ini. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you. See you. See you. Sudah ya, ini selesai ya. Kita lanjut minggu depan.